Hi, welcome back. Or if this is your first time here, my name is Elliot. I am reading a book in every subgenre of every genre. The reason is because I want to read more books. So I'm using genre as the way to direct myself towards books that I might not pick up otherwise. Well, let's jump right into it. The book we'll be exploring this time is in the mystery category, and the subgenre is locked room mystery. The book representing that is And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. Before we get into the contents of the book, let's first talk about locked room mysteries. What are they? Locked room mysteries share a lot of traits with classic murder mysteries, detective stories, whodunits if you will, but a lot of the clues involve how the perpetrator first got into the crime scene and how the perpetrator escaped undetected, hence the locked room element. The reader becomes an active participant in the story as they're given clues, they're encouraged to try to solve the puzzle before the book is over. So that's what I'm going to do as well. I'm going to make my guess for who I believe the murderer in the story is. Uh, I'm about halfway through, so I might not have all the information I need to make the most educated guess, but that's not the point. So stay tuned to hear who I think the murderer is at the halfway point. All right, let's talk about this book. And then there were none. You might already know that this was not the original title for the story. The original title was actually based off of a old racist nursery rhyme. So I'm very glad they changed it. Um, murder mysteries in general don't have the best reputation for being racially sensitive, especially these classics. Um, a lot of them used the Orients as a source of inspiration, as a source of setting, but sometimes it's used in this way to, you know, make it feel like it's exotic or ex mysterious when it's really just another culture, right? So that is what I'm trying to say. Setting. Setting is so important for a locked room mystery because you need to find a way to get all these characters together in an interesting place where they can be trapped together. And, you know, you can only have so many stories about people stuck in an actual locked room. What I do like about Agatha Christie is her ability to move a story along so quickly. Right away, we know about this island that all these characters are going to, and Hey, an island, when you think about it, is pretty much a locked room. It's so hard to introduce 10 characters right away and have the reader be invested in them, let alone even be able to differentiate between them. But one method that Agatha Christie uses when introducing these characters to help us recognize them faster is by introducing them with titles such as Mr., uh, Doctor, General, Judge. It's because we have an easier time recognizing a status in society than we do when we just have a name to follow. So these characters, they're all strangers to each other. They're invited onto this mysterious island by a mysterious host. And very quickly, we see them turning on each other. And in doing so, they start revealing their guilt clues for us to start solving this mystery. I'm really enjoying this book so far because it feels like a murder mystery within a murder mystery. All the characters that are trapped on this island, they are accused of murder and on top of that they are slowly getting murdered themselves. So on one hand you're thinking, okay, did these characters commit their individual murder and who is going to survive until the end? So it leaves a lot of unanswered questions and a good story has questions that the reader want answered and that's kind of how I'm feeling right now. Another thing I'm trying to keep an eye on are the key details that are being repeated because those are probably clues potentially that Agatha Christie wants me to follow or there, there are attempts to mislead me. Another thing I'm wondering about is the significance of the nursery rhyme and the china figurines. Right now it feels a little arbitrary, a little bit forced in terms of giving characters hints about what's going on. I don't know, I hope it wraps up in a nice clever way at the end. So at this halfway point, bunch of the characters have gone every which way. 
There's eight of them left. A few of them were searching the island to see if there was anybody else hiding. There isn't. So, out of these characters, who do I now think is the murderer? First, I want to look at Judge Wargreaves because in the initial moment of the accusation where all the characters were gathered together still, he was the one to lead the investigation, which is great, but it's also a little suspicious. What are you trying to hide? The first real suspect that the book presented was Mr. Rogers after the death of his wife. The characters start having discussion that maybe he killed his wife once the truth was revealed, but that feels too easy. I don't think it's Mr. Rogers. The next suspect, according to my reading, is Miss Brent while talking about the death of her maid who she claimed committed suicide, but she is now being accused of murdering. She didn't really have any remorse for the maid's death, which I found kind of curious. So I wouldn't write her off, but she is still not my pick. My third suspect is Mr. Lombard because he is the only character on the island at the moment with a gun, which is cause for concern. However, if I was to make a pick right now, I would pick General MacArthur because he's just overall acting bizarre and the scenes that he does have, they're not wrapping up nicely. It's not giving me a clue. It's giving me more confusion. So I feel like I should follow his trail a little bit further. So General MacArthur is my pick at the halfway point. Am I right? I don't know. Let me finish reading this book and I'll get back to you with the answer and my final thoughts. Coming now. I'm back and I just finished reading And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie and here are my final thoughts. I find it so funny that the moment I picked General MacArthur to be the murderer, on the next page he dies. That shows how good I am at solving these murder mysteries, but I don't think I was too far off now that I know how it ends. I feel like I noticed a few things here and there. If there's one thing that you should learn from a locked room murder mystery, it's audience retention. How do you get readers from the first page to the very last page? And I think this book does it really well by revealing the answer literally in the very last words of this book. Another technique that I noticed to create suspicion and vulnerability was to find moments where characters can be alone, away from the group, because the perspective is usually following the group. This creates gaps in the story and all good mysteries are about details you don't share. By creating the focus around the group, the reader joins in on the discussions that are happening and can follow the clues as they develop. This allows the writer to point direction and choose which character they want the attention to fall on, who the suspect could be. One moment you're really convinced is this person, the next moment the writer pulls it back. One great way this was done was how the Miss Brent character was treated. One moment you really thought it was her, the next moment it couldn't possibly be her. Another technique was creating disorientation and I think that was done really well with the Armstrong character and how he's labeled a red herring and multiple times in a single chapter we felt one way towards him and then we felt another and then we felt another is like could he have done it or could no he couldn't have obviously by the very end we just feel as surprised as the characters when we finally read his conclusion. So even though I made the wrong prediction of the murderer at the halfway point of the story, I continued to have hunches of who it could be. And at one point, I did consider the fact that, hey, maybe the murderer is someone that has already died, or we thought has already died. In the end, I was genuinely surprised that it was Vera Claythorne that was the last one standing because she kind of flew under the radar the whole story and not a lot of attention was focused on her. So to have it end on her, it's like, what, really? Did she really start all this? But I love how Agatha Christie, the final twist in the story, it just shows so much confidence in her writing style and the story that she wanted to tell to end with a message in a bottle from the judge. It's like, oh, I kind of saw it all coming. I kind of I called it from the beginning. If you 
if you wind it back, I was suspicious of the judge. And I think that's what this book taught me. It's to not worry so much about conventions and just focus on telling the best story possible by revealing the details as they are needed to get the reader to go all the way to the end. This is a solid book. And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. If you're interested in a locker room genre or murder mystery, I think this is a good representation of that genre and it's just a good all around book. And yeah, there it is. I'm Elliot. I'm reading a book in every subgenre of every genre. If that interests you, don't forget to subscribe. Check out this playlist right here and I'll see you next time.